So this is uh, the second part of this lecture. And uh, here is the theorem which we will prove now. So we have a sequence of Levy measures, Mn, and um, we have a sequence of random variables whose distribution is associated to this Levy measure, a non-negative number sigma n square, and an integer, a uh, real number a n. And I'm assuming that uh, this sequence is converging in distribution to some random variable x. And what we want to prove is that there exists a Levy measure m, a non-negative real number sigma square, a real number a, such that the distribution of x is actually the distribution associated to this triple. And moreover, that this triple converges to that one in the following sets. Well, first, for any continuous bounded function f, which vanish in the neighborhood of the origin, so that there exists a delta such that fx is equal to 0 if x it's less equal than delta, then the integral of f with respect to mn converges to f dm. Then there exists a continuity point of m, x0, and we have seen that if this holds for one continuity point, it holds for all continuity points, but what we will prove here is that there exists a continuity point x0 of m, such that x0 and minus x0 actually are continuity points, such that then the integral of x square dmn uh, in this interval minus x0, x0 plus sigma n square converge um, to this expression, and finally that a n converge to a. So um, here what we'll prove is this theorem, and uh, let me explain first the strategy. So the strategy will be um, to show two properties. First, we will show if you well, the idea is that if you want to show that some sequence alpha n converge to alpha, you can uh, proceed in two steps. First, prove that any subsequence nk admits a sub-subsequence nkj such that alpha nkj converge to some alpha prime. So uh, this is some sort of tightness. Any subsequence admits a sub-subsequence which converge, and then prove uniqueness of limits or uniqueness of limit points. So that's saying that if you have two sequence, one of them which converge to alpha prime and another one which converge to alpha double prime, then alpha prime is equal to alpha double prime. So this is the strategy for this sequence. We will first uh, consider a subsequence and extract from this subsequence a subsequence which uh, satisfies all these three properties, and then prove that uh, there is a unique limit point. So this is uh, the strategy of that proof. That proof uh, will be divided in several parts, I think five parts. And the first part of this proof will consist in uh, obtaining properties of the sequence Mn. So uh, part one, so part A, will be uh, to obtain properties of the sequence Mn by knowing that uh, these sequence converge. So let's start. So step one, so say uh, step A1. I know that this sequence converge to x. So let me represent by phi n the characteristic function of this uh, random variable. And since xn converge in distribution to x, we know that this sequence converge to the characteristic function of x, which I'm representing by phi, uniformly on any bounded interval. Now phi is a characteristic function, so phi of 0 is equal to 1, and phi is continuous. So what I claim is that um, is the following. I claim that, um, let me write it here, that if I take the integral of 1 minus cosinus tx dmn, and I sum that sigma n square t squared divided by 2, I take uh, the supremum 
over all n of this quantity, and I take the supremum over all t bounded by t0, if I take the limit as t0 converges to 0, this is equal to 0. So this is uh, the first property which uh, I want to prove. And I started to prove it here, but uh, let me make it clearly. So I want to prove that uh, this limit of the supremum over all t bounded by t0 of the supremum of n of this quantity is equal to 0. So let me fix epsilon positive, and let me prove uh, this property. So as I said, since uh, this sequence converging distribution, the characteristic functions converge uniformly over bounded interval. Now phi is a characteristic function, so it's equal to 1 at 0, and it's continuous. So given that epsilon, I can find some um, t0 such that the modulus of phi of t it's larger than 1 minus epsilon for all t bounded in absolute value by t0. Fine. So if phi of n is converging to phi, the absolute value of phi n is converging. So now let's remember what is phi n of t. Well, phi n of t is the uh, characteristic function of this random variable. And we know that its characteristic function it's given by the exponential of the integral of exponential i t x minus 1 minus i t theta x d m n minus sigma n square t square divided by 2 plus i a n t. So, now, if I take the absolute value of phi and t, you see that um, here I have exponential i a and t. So the um, absolute value of exponential of this quantity is 1. So that will disappear. This expression will also disappear. And that one, well, the i sinus will disappear. Only the cosinus will remain. So the absolute value of phi and t, it's equal to the exponential of the integral of cosinus tx minus 1 dmn plus sigma n square t square divided by 2. And um, since phi of n is converging to phi, the absolute values are converging. This convergence is uniform over bounded intervals. So what I get from here is that uh, there exists n0 such that phi n t. So remember, the phi of the absolute value of phi of t is larger than 1 minus epsilon for all t bounded by t0. Since this convergence is uniform, um, phi n of t will be larger than 1 minus 2 epsilon for all t bounded by t0, provided I take um, n0 sufficiently large. So this holds for all n larger than n0. So the uniform convergence guarantees um, the existence of this n0 from which um, the absolute value of phi and t is bounded below by 1 minus 2 epsilon. Now I want uh, this bound to be to hold for all n, because here I want the supremum over all n. But mind if I take n going from 1 up to n0, since phi n is a characteristic function, it's equal to 1 at 0. So by changing the value of t0, if needed, I can make this inequality hold for all n. So at this point, I change the value of t0. And just to get that uh, this inequality holds for all n larger than 1. So I know that uh, phi n of t is larger. So this means that 1 divided by phi n, the absolute value of phi n of t, it's bounded by 1 divided by 1 minus 2 epsilon. And if I take the logarithm, 
the logarithm of phi and t, that will be bounded by log of 1 minus 2 epsilon, and this is bounded by 3 epsilon, provided epsilon is sufficiently small. And now if I uh, recall what is the absolute value of phi and t, and so the log will cancel the exponential, and here I get the minus sign, and I'm sorry, here it's minus sigma and t, so uh, here it's a plus, but in the definition of the characteristic function, yes, here minus, it's a minus, so I wrote it as a plus, but it's a minus, sorry for that. So now if you take the log of this expression, of the exponential of minus this expression, what we get from this inequality is that the integral of 1 minus cosinus tx dm n plus sigma n square t square divided by 2, that this is bounded by 3 epsilon. And this is exactly uh, what we wanted. What we proved is that for any fixed epsilon, we could find a t0, strictly positive t0, for which, such that for all n and for all t less than t0, this expression is bounded by 3 epsilon, and this is exactly what uh, we are claiming here. So that completes the proof of step A1. So this claim, we have indeed that the limit as t0 goes to 0 of the supremum over all t, supremum over all n, of this quantity, it's equal to 0. Mind that this quantity is not negative. Here we have a positive quantity, and here also a positive quantity. So we have approved this first claim. So now uh, let's go to step 2a. We proved in step 1a that uh, this bound holds for t sufficiently small. From um, that, we can conclude, and uh, I won't prove it here again, but we proved uh, this statement several times, is that for all t positive, there exists a finite constant t such that um, 1 minus cosinus tx dmn, that this is bounded by ct for all n larger than 1. And I'll give you in the note a uh, reference for that statement, but once you know um, that this is bounded by epsilon for t bounded by t0, you can iterate this bound and get that for any t, you can find a finite constant for which uh, this quantity is bounded by ct for all n. And from this bound, we can conclude, uh, we can obtain two uh, further bounds. The first one, which I will call A, because we will use it uh, many times in this proof, is that for all delta, positive, there exists a finite C delta, such that the integral for x larger than delta of mn dx, that this is bounded by C delta. Here we, we already proved uh, that this bound implies that one, so I won't do it here again, but I will give you a reference in the notes. So that's one, um, one bound, and of course this bound holds for all n larger than one. And we have a second bound, so that there exists a finite constant C0, such that the integral for x bounded by 1 of x squared mn dx, that this is bounded by this constant c0, and this also for all n larger than 1. So uh, let me summarize step 2a. From um, this bound, I claim that we can deduce that one just by, um, in some sense, iterating uh, this estimate, or estimate 1 minus cosinus 2t 
in terms of 1 minus cosinus t. So we can iterate uh, this estimate to obtain a bound which holds for all, I didn't write it, but I said it, for all t bounded by t. Okay, so uh, from this estimate, we can show that for any t, we can find ct such that this bound holds for all n and for all t bounded by t. And from this bound, we can uh, deduce two other bounds. The first one, which uh, tells you that we know that mn is a linear measure, so that this integral is finite, but actually it's uniformly bounded in n. And that one also, um, we have a uniform bound in n uh, for uh, this quantity. So I'll call that A, I'll call that B, and we will use these two bounds in uh, the next steps. So here, uh, I summarize what we proved so far. And now I can state step A3. And what I claim is the following, that for any epsilon positive, I can find A epsilon um, finite such that if A is larger than A epsilon, then the measure of minus A, A complement, so you take the interval minus A, A, you take the complement of that, and that this is bounded by epsilon. So uh, I claim, and this is for all n larger than 1. Right. So if you give me any epsilon, I can find A epsilon sufficiently large, such that, well, if I take A larger than A epsilon, then the measure of uh, this set is bounded by epsilon. And the proof of um, this claim, again, I won't uh, prove it because we have already uh, proved such a bound. So remember that if mu n is a probability measure or a sequence of probability measure, we have the following bound that mu n of minus a a complement it's bounded by a constant, so there exists a constant C0, which is universal, such that this measure, it's bounded by constant divided um, multiplying A. The integral from 0 to 1 divided by A of 1 minus the real part of the characteristic function phi of mu n. So maybe let me write this in this way. So what I claim is, well, we proved in a previous lecture that there exists a universal constant C0 such that, well, if mu is a probability measure and phi of mu is characteristic function, then the measure of this set is bounded by C0, which is um, this universal constant time A times the integral from 0 to 1 over 1 divided by A of 1 minus the real part of the characteristic function. So uh, what I claim is that if you repeat exactly the proof uh, I presented for this bound, what we get is that if M now it's a Levy measure, there exists uh, this uh, universal constant such that, uh, and remember that this holds for all A, so th such that this is bounded by 0, 1, A, and dt. And here I have the integral of 1 minus cosinus tx mu dx. So uh, what I claim is that if you repeat the proof, and instead of a probability measure mu, now you have a Levy measure, you can prove um, this bound. So now, um, so what I ask you is to go back to the proof to uh, convince yourself that this inequality holds. And once you have this inequality, it's easy to prove uh, this claim by uh, the bound we already obtained. So, so proof now of the claim. You fix 
an epsilon, a positive. So you know um, that this quantity, it's converging to um, zero uniformly. So there exists a t0. Since um, sigma square t squared divided by 2, it's positive. It's this integral is bounded by epsilon. So what we get is that there exists t0 such that the integral of 1 minus cosinus tx mn dx, that this is bounded by epsilon for all t less or equal than t0. Right, well, of course, this t0 uh, depends on epsilon, so it might be might be better to call it t of epsilon. So it follows uh, from our first claim that we can find this t epsilon such that this quantity is bounded by epsilon provided t it's bounded by t epsilon. Now, if I take a epsilon as 1 of t epsilon, and I now I choose a larger than a epsilon, so by choosing a larger than t epsilon, what I get is that if I take a t which is bounded by 1 over a, it's also bounded by 1 over a epsilon. And therefore, by uh, this bound, this quantity here, if I take n now, this quantity here, it's bounded by epsilon for all n follows uh, from uh, this estimate that this quantity is bounded by epsilon for all n, provided I choose a epsilon to be 1 over t epsilon. And if this is bounded by epsilon, you see what appears here, it's an average. So uh, this gives me 1. What we proved is that mn of minus a a complement, it's bounded by c0 times epsilon. And this is exactly what we wanted to prove. So we fixed an epsilon, and we found an a epsilon, such that for any a larger than a epsilon, the measure of this quantity, well, we didn't prove it's bounded by epsilon. We proved it it's bounded by c0 epsilon, but that's exactly the same thing. So uh, this proves our third claim um, in this proof. Now, I wrote here, uh, what we just proved, so that for all epsilon, there exists a epsilon, such that this uh, expression is bounded for all n larger than 1. So let me uh, now claim step a4. And for that, I will introduce a function, wx, which is x squared divided by 1 over 1 plus x squared. So x squared divided by 1 plus x squared. So mind that this uh, function behaves as x squared for x small and behaves like a bounded continuous function for x large. Let me define alpha n to be the integral of wx mn dx. So we know um, that for each fixed n, this quantity is bounded because m is a Levy measure. And we know that the Levy measures integrated x squared at the origin and bounded continuous functions far from the origin. So alpha n, it's well defined. But actually, we have a bound because um, what I claim is that there exists a C0, which is finite, such that alpha n, it's bounded by C0 for all n larger than 1. So this is uh, my fourth claim. And uh, let's prove that alpha n is uniformly bounded. Well, I will decompose uh, this integral in two pieces. The pieces in which x is bounded by 1 of alpha x and, and the x. And then a piece in which x is larger than 1, alpha x uh, wx mn dx. 
Now, um, for x less or equal than 1, I will uh, just estimate uh, this quantity, wx, by a constant times x squared. So this is uh, bounded by 2 times x squared. And you know that by property b, the uh, integral of x squared for x bounded by 1 of mn, it's uniformly bounded by a constant c0. So this first quantity, it's uniformly bounded by a constant. While for the second quantity, well, now I'm taking x um, larger than 1, and you see that for x larger than 1, I'll simply bound it wx by 1 and use uh, the property A. So A tells me, taking delta equal to 1, that um, this, the measure of this set, it's bounded by a constant C1 uniformly in L. So by putting together estimate A and B and using the, these two bounds for W, that W is bounded by a constant times x squared for x uh, smaller than 1 and bounded by 1 for x larger than 1, we conclude um, this step A4, which uh, provides us a uniform bound in alpha n given uh, by this expression. So this completes the first part of the proof. So we obtain several bounds on uh, our sequences. Now we start uh, the second part of the proof, and in the uh, part B of this proof, uh, I, as I said, start with a sequence, a subsequence nk, but I forget that this is a subsequence, I will represent it by n, and my goal here in part B will be to, uh, starting from this subsequence, get a sub subsequence n k j, uh, such that, well, uh, this first property holds. So I want to obtain a Levy measure. So starting from this sequence, obtain a subsub sequence, which the following property, well, there exists a Levy measure m, such that f d m n converge to f d m for all continuous bounded function which uh, vanish in the neighborhood of the origin. So this is the first property, and the second property is that if I take a continuity point x0 of m, then the integral of, and here of course I'm talking about the subsequence, that this is converging to minus x0, x0, x squared dm. So let me repeat, so part b, will consist in the following. I start with a subsequence, and I want to extract from this subsequence a sub subsequence, which has the following property. Well, there exists a Levy measure m, such that f, the integral of f with respect to this sub subsequence converge, and x square, the integral of x square with respect to this measure m, Levy measure m and kj, in this integral converge to that one, uh, provided x0, it's and minus x0 or continuity points alpha. So that will be um, the goal of part B, and part B itself will be divided in several steps. So remember, I'm starting with a subsequence nk, but I re represent this subsequence just by uh, the sequence n itself. Now, I will consider alpha n. So remember, alpha n is uh, this integral, and this integral is bounded. So we have a sequence of non-negative real numbers which is bounded. So I can extract from this um, sequence a subsequence which converge. And again, uh, well, I don't want to write nk all the time, so I'll just assume that alpha n is converging to alpha, which is a non-negative real number. So I will divide now uh, this argument in two parts. I'll first 
consider the case in which alpha is zero, and then the case in which alpha is uh, strictly positive. So assume in B1 that alpha, our sequence alpha n is converging to zero. Then what I claim is that um, what I said, so that we have this convergence for m equal to zero and that convergence also for m equal to zero. So my claim, it's, um, uh, let's say I, I claim that f d m n, so I'm assuming that alpha n is converging to zero. Remember here it's always subsequence, which I'm talking about, but I don't, I'm representing the subsequence by the sequence itself. And uh, what I'm claiming is that if alpha n converges to zero, then f d m is converging to zero, which is the integral of f d m, provided that m is identically equal to zero, and this holds for all functions f, which are continuous and bounded on R, and which vanish in the neighborhood of the origin. So this is my first claim, and my second claim is that, well now, any point x0, it's a continuity point of m, and so I claim that for all x0 positive, the integral from minus x0, x0, um, x square dmn, that this is converging to zero as well. So let me put, let me prove i and 2i. So uh, let's prove one. So let me fix a function f, which is continuous and bounded, and which vanish in the neighborhood of the origin. And I want to show that f d m converge to zero. So let's consider the absolute value of the integral of f with respect to d m n. So this is bounded by f d m n. Now, what I claim is that uh, f it's bounded above by a constant times w x. So remember, w x is the function x square one plus x square. Since uh, f it's equal to zero between uh, minus delta and plus delta, this function outside of this interval is strictly positive and bounded, so I can choose f it's a bounded function, so I can choose this constant sufficiently large to have uh, this bound for all x. Right? So since this function it's uh, strictly positive and more precisely it's bounded below by a constant which depends on delta which is strictly positive in uh, the set R minus the interval minus delta delta. So this holds for all these points. And since this function is uh, bounded, well, we can find a constant C0 sufficiently large to have this bound for all x in R. So I can estimate this by C0 x square dmn, but this is the definition of um, sorry, not x squared, but wx. But this is the definition of alpha n. By assumption, alpha n, so this is equal to uh, c0 alpha n. By assumption, alpha n is equal converging to zero. So indeed, we prove that f dmn is converging to zero. So that's my first claim. Now I want to prove the second claim. I'll prove it exactly in the same way. I want to prove um, that minus x0, x0, x square dmn is converging to zero. But what I claim is that since I'm considering this um, expression interval minus x0, x0, I can find a constant c0 
such that this quantity is bounded by wx dmn. Right. What uh, now I'm using is that x square it's bounded by a constant x square 1 plus x square provided that x square it's less or equal than x0. So there is a constant c0 which depends on uh, x0 such that this quantity is bounded by that one. You see that x square simplifies, so what I really need to choose it's a constant such that 1 plus x squared is bounded by c0 and can choose therefore c0 to be 1 plus x0 squared. So there exists uh, this constant c0 which depends on x for which this bound holds, but this is again c0 alpha n and by assumption alpha n converge to 0. So indeed uh, if alpha n converge to 0 then mn it's converging to 0 in the sense I wanted, so in the sense that this holds and that uh, this quantity here it's converging to um, it's the same quantity with m replacing mn. So uh, in the case in which alpha n converge to 0. So if alpha n, what I just proved, let me repeat, if alpha n converge to 0, then this quantity converge to 0 and this quantity here converge to 0 for all x0. So now let's uh, consider the uh, second possible case, the case in which alpha n is converging to alpha. And this one is slightly more demanding, but it's also uh, not difficult to prove. I'm assuming that alpha n is converging to some alpha, which is now strictly positive. And uh, in order to analyze this question, I will introduce a measure mu n dx, which is a sequence of probability measures. So this will be to take the measure mn dx, multiply it by uh, alpha omega x, because now I know that this integral is equal to alpha n, and divide that by alpha n. So mu n defined in this way, it's a probability measure that sequence of probability measure. So <clears throat> I'm assuming that alpha n is converging to alpha, which is strictly positive. So my claim B1, say, is that this sequence mu n, it's tight. So I have a sequence of probability measure, and what I'm claiming is that this sequence of probability measure, it's tight. And remember what tight means. Tight means that for all epsilon, positive, I can find a epsilon such that mu n of minus a epsilon, a epsilon complement that this is bounded by epsilon. So this is my claim. So let's prove it. Let's fix epsilon positive and let's recall what uh, mu n minus a epsilon a epsilon complement, so this is the integral for x larger than a epsilon of mu n dx. But mu n dx, I have its definition here, so this is 1 over alpha n, x larger than a epsilon of wx which is x square 1 plus x square dmn. And um, so now I can, so remember, we have this bound, which is uniformly in n. So given that epsilon, I can find this a epsilon, such that the measure of this quantity is bounded by epsilon for all n. And since x squared divided by 1 plus x squared, it's bounded by 1. This quantity is bounded by 1 over alpha n. x larger than a epsilon of mn d 
quantity x. By choosing this a epsilon, I get that this quantity here is bounded by alpha epsilon, while this one it's converging to 1 over alpha. So um, this is bounded by a constant c0 divided, uh, multiplying by epsilon, and this is exactly what we wanted to prove. We wanted to prove that mu n is tight, and uh, so given epsilon, we obtain this a epsilon for which this is bounded by epsilon. Of course, we get c0 epsilon, but it doesn't make any difference. So now, uh, since this sequence mu n is tight, step b2, I can uh, obtain a subsequence which converge. So my step, it's saying that, well, now let's apply what we know already. We can take a subsequence, but I represent this subsequence by mu n still. That mu n, it's converging to some mu dx. And here, mu dx, it's a probability measure on R. And by this formula, I want to define m, m dx by exactly the same formula. So this is, will be to take alpha divided by omega x mu dx. Alpha is the limit of alpha n. And so this uh, defines a measure. And my claim is twofold. First, I claim that m is a Levy measure. And then that mn converge to m in the sense which I, I make precise before, in, which means that uh, this quantity converges to that quantity for all such functions f, and that uh, this integral is converging to that integral. So uh, we have two things to prove, that m is a Levy measure, and that mn is converging to m in that sense. So let's prove that. So first step, b2, m is Levy. So to prove that m is Levy, I need to prove uh, two things. I first need to show that for all delta uh, positive, there exists uh, c delta, such, which is finite, such that the integral for x larger than delta of m dx, that this is finite. So this is, um, more precisely, for all delta, this integral is finite. So I claim that this holds, and let's prove it. So in order to prove that, I have to prove that x larger than delta, but what is um, m dx? We have the definition of f dx here. This is alpha. 1 divided by wx. wx, remember, it's x squared divided by 1 plus 2x squared. So this is and mu um, dx. So um, I want to prove that this quantity here, it's bounded. But since I'm taking x larger than delta, this function here, it's bounded by a constant which depends on delta. 1 plus x squared divided by x squared. If x is larger than delta, it's bounded by um, a constant, which is, so this is bounded by a constant, which depends on delta, times alpha, times the measure of the set at which x is larger than delta of mu. I mean, mu is a probability measure, so this is bounded by 1. And this uh, proves that, indeed, for any delta, um, this measure here, it's finite because mu is a probability measure. So that's uh, the first claim. Then the second claim, which we need to show, is that if I take now x bounded by 1, then m integrated the x squared. So again, <coughs> I want to prove um, that this bound holds. So let's take x less or equal than 1, x squared m dx, 
but by definition of m, this is alpha x bounded by 1. I have here x squared, and then 1 over wx, but wx is 1 plus x squared divided by x squared, mu dx. Now you see that x squared cancel with x squared. 1 plus x squared is bounded for x bounded by 1. So this is it's bounded by 1, so here is 2. So this is bounded by 2 times alpha, the measure of this set, which is bounded by 1. So uh, we also have that this quantity is finite, and this proves that m satisfies uh, these two bounds, and therefore that m is indeed a Levy mesh. So what remains to be proved is that these uh, two quantity here I'm taking only uh, this measure converge. So my claim B3. So let me just uh, rewrite what I raised, which is M, the definition of M dx. So M dx, it's alpha divided by omega x mu dx. And now let's consider function f, which is bounded and continuous in R. And let's assume that there exists a delta positive such that f of x is equal to 0 for x less or equal than delta. And what I want to prove is that f d m n is converging to f d m. Well, so in order to prove that, uh, let's recall what fdm n is, and here's the uh, definition. So this is f. Now mn it's alpha n divided by 1 divided by omega x mu n dx. So this is the definition of um, mn. So this is equal to alpha n. Now 1 over wx, this is 1 plus x squared, x squared mu n dx. But now you see, since f vanish uh, in an interval which contains the origin, this function which appears here, it's a continuous bounded function. So if I call g the function f multiplying 1 plus x squared divided by x squared, this is a bounded continuous function. Since it's a bounded continuous function and mu n converge to mu weakly, well, this converge and alpha n is converging to alpha. So this is converging to alpha f 1 plus x squared x squared dm, d mu. And now you have to recall the definition of m. m is exactly alpha multiplying 1 plus x squared divided by x squared, because this is 1 over wx d mu. So this is exactly f d m. So indeed, uh, we proved that for uh, this subsequence which we constructed, indeed, we have that the integral of f with respect to m n converge to the integral of f with respect to m for all uh, such functions. Now, the last um, fact which I want to prove in this uh, third step is that if I take the integral from minus x0, x0 of x squared d m n, that this converge to minus x0 to x0, x squared dm, provided x0 and minus x0 are continuity points of m. So I'm fixing uh, x0 such that x0 and minus x0 are continuity points of m, and I want to prove um, that we have this convergence. Now, uh, by definition, if x0 and minus x0 are continuity points, this means that 
x0 and minus x0 are continuity points of mu. Then, by uh, definition, this is the integral of minus x0 to x0, x squared, mn. Uh, here we have the definition. This is alpha n. 1 divided by w, but 1 divided by w is 1 plus x squared divided by x squared, d mu n. Now you see that x squared cancel with uh, 1 over x squared. And we have a function 1 plus x squared, which is uh, bounded and continuous in this interval. And so this function is equal to the function 1 plus x squared, which is multiplying the indicator of minus x0, x0. So you see that uh, this is a function which is 1 plus x squared until x0, x0, and then you have it is equal to 0 in uh, the other portion. So we have a discontinuity at this point. So it's a continuous function with two discontinuities. But since minus x0 and x0, which are the discontinuity points, are continuity points of mu, this quantity here, this integral, it's converging. So alpha n, it's converging to alpha. And um, well, since the measure of the discontinuity points of the functions have measure 0, with respect to the limiting measure mu. So this is converging to minus x0, x0, 1 plus x squared d mu. But now I can, again, uh, divide by x squared and multiply by x squared to observe that actually the right-hand side is exactly equal to uh, this integral. And therefore, indeed, we proved that uh, if these two points are continuity points of m, this convergence holds. So um, this is part b. So in part b, uh, we could extract from the fact that this sequence is uh, bounded a subsequence mu and k such that, um, well, these alpha n's are converging. And mu n, it's converging to uh, some Levy measure mu in this sense, that this holds and this quantity also converge, provided minus x0 and x0 are continuity points. So um, this is part p. Now we'll turn to uh, the convergence of sigma n square. So now let's turn uh, to part c of this proof, which uh, is to start analyzing the convergence of sigma n square. So, and for that, we will, uh, I will recall uh, this bound. So my claim is that if you start from a sequence nk or a subsequence nk, I can always find a sub-subsequence sigma nk j's such that this sequence is converging to some sigma square. And why is that so? Well, because if you look at uh, the first bound we obtained in this proof. So you fix, uh, let's say, epsilon equal to 1. By fixing this epsilon equal to 1, you, s you know that, well, this limit will be bounded by 1. So that you can find uh, t0, which depends on this 1 you gave, such that sigma n square t square divided by 2, it's bounded by 1. Because, well, this quantity is positive, since the sum of these two quantities is bounded by 1, this one also will be bounded by 1. And uh, therefore, that this sequence sigma n square, it's bounded by 2 times divided by t0 square. So it's a bounded sequence. And from this bounded sequence, you can extract a sub sub sequence which converge. So at this point, what we did is that we started from a subsequence nk. And from this subsequence, we were able to ex extract a sub subsequence such that mu nk and sigma nk satisfy these two conditions. Right? 
we proved the first condition that for any continuous bounded function f which satisfy this condition we have that convergence and also condition b which is that um, this integral plus sigma n squared is converging to that quantity. So what we proved so far is that under the assumptions of the theorem, given a subsequence, we can extract a subsequence such that this triple is converging to some m sigma square zero. So remember, um, what we defined convergence of these sort of triples, the convergence was uh, defined through uh, these three conditions by fixing a n equal to zero. What we have is that indeed uh, this sequence, this triple, the sequence of triples is converging to this uh, triple. And from that now we will, um, we are almost done. So it now remains to prove that if I consider, so my claim now uh, is that if you now consider in the same se subsequence a and kj, that a and kj converge to some a. So this is my next step, and this is part d of the proof. So let me just um, summarize what we did so far. We uh, started from any subsequence nk, and we were able to extract from that subsequence a subsequence for which m nkj and sigma nkj zero converge to a triple. So I wrote the conclusion of part c here. Given a subsequence nk, we can find a subsequence for which we have this convergence. Now let's do turn to uh, part D, and for that I will need a lemma, a very simple lemma, which uh, tells us the following. Assume that you have a sequence xn, which is converging to, in distribution, to some uh, random variable x. And then assume that we also know that xn plus an, it's converging to some random variable y in distribution. Then what I claim is that a n actually converge to a. And moreover, x plus a, it's equal to y in distribution. So uh, let me uh, state this lemma again. Assume that you have a sequence of random variables x n which converge in distribution to some random variable x. And assume further that if you add a n to the sequence x n, xn plus an converge in distribution to y, to another uh, random variable y. Then what I claim is that actually this sequence converge, and moreover, x plus y is equal to y in distribution. And the proof, well, the proof is uh, very simple. We know that fxn, which is the characteristic function of the random variable xn, converge to phi of t, and this for O uh, t. And we know also that the characteristic function of xn plus a n of t converge to the characteristic function of y, which I'm representing by phi y of t. But the characteristic function of xn plus a n, since a n, well, I didn't say, but I think it was obvious that a n is a sequence of real numbers. This is equal to phi xn of t exponential minus i a n of t. So now <coughs> you see that if you take, well, this is converging, you know that at t equal to zero, this is one. So this quantity will be different from one close to the origin. Since the convergence is uniform, this quantity is um, also different from zero for uh, at least for t small. So I can divide that by t. So if I divide that by, um, so I know that this quantity is converging minus a 
and t it's converging to phi y of t. Since this expression is converging to phi x of t, we have, and well, it's different from 0 for t sufficiently close to the origin. This implies that this quantity is also converging, at least for t close to the origin, but that means that the sequence an is converging. So we get that an has to converge. Let me represent by a its limit. Well, but if a is the limit of an, this is converging to exponential. Um, and I do not know why I wrote minus. This is a plus, a and t. So here's a plus, sorry. Those, so this is a and a i, so i a t. So this is converging to phi x t. This is converging to exponential i a t. And this is therefore equal to phi y of t. But this is the uh, characteristic function of f x plus a of t. And since the characteristic function of y is equal to the one of x plus a, this means that y is equal to x plus a in distribution. And this proves um, this simple lemma. And we will now uh, apply this lemma in order to uh, show that the sequence a and kj converge. So uh, here is what we proved. Now let me uh, conclude the argument, part e. My claim is that a and k j also converge. So under this assumption. So if this triple converge, what I claim is that um, this sequence converge. And for that, I will use the lemma. By the first part of the proof, if this triple converge to this one, then the random variable whose distribution is associated this, to this triple converge to that one. So let me represent by x, m, n, k, j, sigma, n, k, j, square, 0, the random variable which is associated to uh, this triple. And this one, it's converging in distribution to uh, x, m, sigma, square, 0. But now, if I add a and kj to this random variable, the distribution of this random variable is equal to the distribution of the random variable associated to the triple m and kj sigma n k j square, a n k j. But by assumption, we know that these uh, sequence converge in distribution. And therefore, if I take a subsequence, it's also converging in distribution to the same object. So this one is converging in distribution to x. And well, therefore, we are exactly under the assumptions of the lemma. We have a sequence which converge in distribution. And if we add to this sequence um, the sequence a and kj, a sequence of uh, real numbers, it also converge. Then uh, by applying the lemma, we get that a and kj converge. So a and kj converge as we claimed. And this proves part uh, e. And therefore, we can now summarize what we proved so far. So the conclusion is that if we are given a sequence nk, then we can extract a subsequence nkj such that the triple m nkj sigma nkj square a nkj converge to m sigma square a. So we proved that uh, any subsequence admits a subsequence for which this um, sequence of triples converge to uh, some triple whose first coordinate is a living measure, sigma square it's a non-negative real number, and a it's a real number. So that proves the first part of the theorem in which, uh, as I claimed at the beginning when I presented the strategy, 
that we would prove that we have some tightness or some compactness in the sense that any sequence admits a sub-subsequence which converge. So this is exactly what we proved so far. Now, to complete uh, the proof of the theorem, it remains to guarantee uniqueness. So assume that you have a sequence here which uh, it's converging to a, tr a subsequence which is converging to some triple. And so now uniqueness. So in order to uh, complete the proof of the theorem, it remains to show uniqueness. So assume that you have a subsequence which converge to m sigma square a, and another one, m and prime kj, or tilde, sigma n kj tilde, a n kj tilde, which would be converging to some other m tilde sigma square tilde a tilde. So assume that there exist two subsequence which are converging to uh, different objects, to different triples. Well, but now um, we can go back to um, the first part of the theorem. If this triple is converging to that one, this means that the random variable associated to this triple is converging in distribution to uh, the random variable associated to that triple. And the same thing here can be said to this one. But <clears throat> this is telling us, well, since we know that the sequence itself is converging in distribution, this tells us that yeah, we have, um, well, this is converging to x, so a subsequence is converging to x. This means that x, the distribution of this random variable, is equal to x, and the distribution of that one is equal to x. Therefore, these uh, two random variables have the same distribution. And now, by the uniqueness of the levy kinchin representation of visible uh, random law, we know that, well, if this random variable has the same distribution as that one, this means that m has to be equal to m tilde, sigma square has to be equal to sigma tilde square, and a has to be equal to uh, a tilde, and that proves uniqueness. So remember here that we are always assuming that M puts no mass at the origin. And therefore, um, this proves this, the uniqueness of limits. So we proved uh, compactness. Now we prove uniqueness of limits. And that uh, shows that, indeed, we have the convergence of uh, the triple mn sigma n square an. So that there exists a triple m sigma square a such that um, the sequence mn sigma n square a and it's converging to m sigma square a in the sense of these three conditions. And that uh, completes the proof of uh, this theorem.